on this episode of China Unscripted, are Americans waking up to the threat of the Chinese Communist Party? And why we don't need to decouple from China, but we do need to disentangle from China. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us today is David Stilwell. He's the former Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He also served in the Air Force for 35 years, including as the defense attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. And he's also been the director of the China Strategic Focus Group at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. So David, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. I'm a big admirer of your work. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I liked I liked a lot of how the China U.S. China policy changed when uh, you were you were the Assistant Secretary of State. Actually, one uh, one thing I want to ask about is when you were in that position, you talked a lot about the idea of reciprocity. What does that mean? Well, I, you know, I'm a career military guy and didn't know anything about diplomacy uh, until I went to Bowling Air Force Base in Maryland, uh, where they hold the Joint Military Attaché School. And what they told me is that, you know, in your past life, your weapons were bullets and bombs and things that blow up. In your new life as a diplomat, you have two weapons, and those are whiskey and words. <laughs> and the only way you can get the other side to, you know, live up to its commitments and to treat you with respect is through transactional reciprocal treatment. If you deny me this, I deny you that. This is the fundamental basis of, of diplomacy. What about honey traps? Uh, well, okay, that's that's a different um, animal. Let, let's talk about white world uh, diplomacy, not the rest of that. Um, but so, you know, if our diplomats are being, tr- being treated badly in China, then we should, in theory, return the favor uh, but we haven't. We've always made excuses to say, you know, we, we, if you treat China like an enemy, they'll become one. I mean, all these just trite, unthought, um, you know, uh, aphorisms. So, well, we we know that doesn't work because China has treated us like an enemy, and we haven't become one. They call us the enemy. They go, they openly call us, and you know, in amongst themselves, the enemy. And uh, and so, one of the things we want to do is just simply well, get away from that idea that that you know, we need to cooperate more and we need to meet them where they're at. And, and, and we did, uh, to some effect that uh, it needed a little more time to, to come to complete fruition. But I do think we made some, some ground. Um, you, I, I defer to you, you probably know better. You, you're, you're more objective than I am. Well, I'm curious what you saw. Where do you think the idea that like, oh, we, we, we can't treat China as an enemy or they'll become an enemy. where did that obviously bogus notion come from? Why was it so entrenched for so long? There's um, a long list, and I don't want to embarrass anyone, but just a long list of people who take a uh, one-sided view to this and what worked in Europe they thought would work in, in elsewhere. The other part of that, though, is what we're seeing today in academia and other places is that once, I mean, the virology, the Wuhan Institute of Virology story, so many people went down record early on saying it couldn't possibly have been the virology lab um, that they risk embarrassment by reversing themselves. It's, no one wants to admit they were wrong, right? Because your credibility in the future suffers. And I think that's also the case, you know. And there is so much hope with uh, all these these uh, discussions and conversations and dialogues that we had, SNED, DNSD, I mean, alphabet soup, hundreds. I think there were 150 different dialogues like that produced nothing. But nobody wanted to admit it because they had hung their reputation, their credibility on the fact that I'm having these meetings with China. You're talking about dialogues between the U.S. government and the Chinese government? Official. Track one. Mm-hmm. So how did China respond to you talking about this reciprocity? Um, well, you saw the Global Times and others, um, you know, both professional and personal attacks uh, on that. Uh, I do say, though, that, you know, one of my mottos was we have to speak to them in a language they understand. Uh, I think for the longest time, they were wondering when we would actually wake up. I mean, there's was, there was some some confusion as to what, what are the Americans doing? There was this, I think, a fear that there was something happening below the waterline they weren't aware of, which was the only explanation for the Americans continuing to give away the store the way they were. Uh, so I would say some confusion, but in some ways, there was also a sense of relief that, OK, now we're actually having a conversation on a level uh, field that we both understand. Um, 
and, and you know, the dialogue, it, it didn't open up. But the fact is that we didn't keep coming to them, begging them to talk to us and, and, and asking uh, to be nice to us. We basically said, we have an issue here. We have offered to talk. You haven't taken it seriously. So we're just going to wait patiently until you are ready to talk. And when you are, we'll be happy to come uh, have a conversation. And those two opportunities happened in August of 2019 and June of 2020, when uh, Yang Jie Chir came to the U.S. to uh, meet, you know, officially with uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. And that was just us, you know, being patient and waiting for them until they reached a point where they're ready to talk. Boy, I'm, I'm now thinking about some more recent U.S.-China meetings with uh, Yang Jie Chir. It was didn't didn't quite go like so the, well. The Alaska meeting. I'm thinking that, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not going to be critical of, of the current folks. They're going about it in a way they think uh, is right. And if you've seen, they have continued the Trump uh, administration policies almost verbatim. So they see the value in that, and they are executing it. I think in, in you know in a way they find um, helpful to themselves. Uh, and there's a learning curve there. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but here's the deal. You can't want dialogue too much. You, you, the other, if the other side doesn't want it, it's like anything. Look, when I went to Beijing as a defense attache, I, I went during the ardent suitor uh, period where I'm the high school uh, pimply faced nerd trying to get the beautiful cheerleader to go out with me. And so I'm endlessly saying, oh, please, 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 offering gifts, anything to talk to me. And what's her incentive to do that? Nothing. Um, so uh, we played ardent suitor for a long time and then finally said, you know what? Uh, this hasn't worked. I gave a speech at CSIS in December of 19 on this topic. It was about 40 years of trying to win China over. If we had quit too soon, you know, we'd have been justifiably uh, self-critical of maybe not giving it enough try. 40 years uh, of trying, I think, was sufficient. And nobody could blame us of being, you know, hair trigger on this, of, of going too soon. We, I think, I think the previous administration's Rightly, I was part of that, said we need to give them every opportunity and we need to get at the uh, other voices and factions maybe inside China who understand the benefit of having these uh, cooperative sort of uh, engagements. But after 40 years, it was time to throw up our hands and say they don't want it. They're not going to, no matter how much we beg, they're not going to join us. So now we're going to meet them uh, where they are. And, and that's where we're at now. Did you have a moment that changed your mind about how the U.S. was approaching China? I did. Um, when I was a defense attache, I, you know, not, not knowing any better, I went to the <clears throat> PRC and my folks told me that uh, we really have no way of, you know, like emergency hotline phone calls. We don't have a phone number. They're very protective uh, of being seen perhaps as you know, traitorous activity of having these private conversations with the Americans. So they don't have no conversation at all. And some of my subordinates did have um, maybe some contact with their their partners. But I personally, as a defense attache, uh, had no direct contact with anybody on the, on the Chinese side. All communications happened via fax. In Beijing, you had to fax them? I had, uh, I had, I had a fax number. And then if there was a request for a delegation, or support or demarche that was done by fax again at my level. So I was in Beijing, I was in DC talking to my counterpart, and in Xunanfeng, and I said, uh, "How's it work for you?" It goes, and you know, he he would, I and mean, I knew he was making calls to anybody in the U.S. government or in Paycom or anywhere, setting up lunches, having conversations. So I said, "How is this fair in terms of reciprocity and otherwise? How is it fair that I am cut off completely and you have full access?" And he kind of s- smirked. He didn't smile. He kind of grin and he goes, well, it's not our system. Our system doesn't allow us to you know, give you full access to us. Your system allows us that. And of course, we're going to take advantage of that. So that was the beginning of understanding just how out of balance this relationship was and how necessary it was to um, insist that, you know, they talk about mutual benefit, mutual respect and win-win outcomes in this Xinxing Daguo Guanxi, you know, the new type great power competition. And so I'm just holding them to that. You know, mutual respect means I have the same contact that you do. Mutual benefit means we can have a conversation uh, as needed. You know, there's been a lot of criticism of reciprocity as in, you know, well, shouldn't the U.S. be taking the high road, you know, just because the Chinese government is petty about certain things or, you know, shouldn't the U.S. be treating them better because we are, you know, we are better. We have the better system. We should be treating them better or, you know, things like. Uh, if you 
do this, then you're actually limiting U.S. access to China in an unhelpful way, like getting our uh, U.S. media kicked out of China. What would you say to that? I say we tried all that stuff. Yeah, you, it, well, Einstein says what insanity is trying the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different outcome. Um, we tried it. We tried everything. And uh, eventually you have to go with what works. And uh, when all else fails, you, you know, you're know you reduced level by level by level to the most basic. And the most basic is you get one reporter, we get one reporter. You get one reporter like that. So um, as far as media being kicked out, uh, we didn't kick them out. Uh, we actually took a very, uh, I think, a benevolent approach in simply naming organizations whose job was to transmit to American people messages from the Chinese government. That's a foreign mission. That is not a legitimate media outlet, right? Xinhua, CCTV, CGTN, and the rest. Uh, and just identifying from what they really are is, you know, they're mouthpieces of the Chinese government. You know, one of the questions I asked is, show me a single byline from your Xinhua reporters here. Show me a single byline back in Beijing that reports on what's going on in the U.S. And you can't show me any. Because remember, the, their job is to take information from Beijing propaganda department and funnel it into the American media for American people to digest quite effectively, by the way. The China Daily inserts and all that stuff, people unconsciously or sometimes consciously repeat back the, the propaganda lines on that. So, yes, we would love to operate in, in a much higher plane, um, but we're not allowed to do that. Finally, um, we did remove 60 journalists, so-called journalists, back um I think March, April of last year. Uh, and they, of course, responded by decrementing our 50 down to 30 or whatever it was. The way this is gonna, was going to end up is it was going to go to zero. And then, like I said, we were going to go back to true reciprocity. You let one American in, we'll let a Chinese reporter in like that and build it back up because it's already out of whack, right? There's no way we're going to win this, this decrement war because we get to zero well before they did. So, you know, eventually we're just going to have to like start from scratch. Do you think it's challenging to communicate this to other politicians or even to the American public? As, as you said, China has been very successful at propagandizing the American public. Um, like if people don't go through the experience of like having to fax an official, how do you how do you change the dialogue so that, uh, you know, the American people understand like this is an unfair relationship that they don't just see, oh, why is the U.S.? treating Chinese media like that? Well, first off, we can't become them. We have to stay true to our values and, you know, media freedom and all those things are those. It's a very frustrating question because I've been asking myself that uh, a long time. A couple of things we tried that didn't really take off well because of the pandemic was there's a program called Hometown Diplomat where we get our very, you know, our, our foreign service professionals to go back to their homes and then have these conversations one-on-one -on -one where it becomes real and personal. That was one. We, we had some success in that, you know, going to the local Rotary. I'll tell you what, what really works, and it's things that U.S. government can't control, it's just, well, we control it by uh, continuing to put the signal in the air that there's something wrong here. Uh, Ennis Cantor, the Boston Celtics uh, Center, going off on Uyghur uh, you know, slave labor, you know, oppression, locking them up, killing them on his shoes. That's making it real, too. I use my kids as a barometer. And you know, if they're telling me that they're seeing something, then I know it's working. It's getting down to the, the level of you know everyday Americans who really can't be expected to be worried about foreign policy and those things, right? They're, they, they've got other things to do. That, that's kind of our job to take it off their plate. But how do you make it real to the American people? You, you eventually it has to come out in in you know uh, you know just public media, normal media conversations. And on the subject of media. Uh, you know, we talk about political warfare and the PRC's efforts to divide and conquer inside the U.S. And if you watch the media over the years, it is definitely split and bifurcated where you have entirely different sets of facts. And I don't think that's entirely the, the uh, CCP is doing, but we know that they've helped with that. They, they, they look for ways to make uh, us so busy fighting each other that we're not even thinking about this problem uh, of the PRC in China and the PRC activities inside the U.S. So that's something we have to work on is getting the American narrative inside the U.S. Uh, more convergent, less divergent, getting people to agree on common sets of facts and discussing the areas we don't agree in the margins. Uh, that's a huge lift. And uh, again, but we just have to talk about it. Education, critical thinking and all the rest. 
Can you give us an example of how the Chinese Communist Party leveraged uh, wedge issues in the United States? COVID origins. Mm. So um, 31st of January, uh, the, we, with the NSC, closed the borders to China travel. Uh, shortly after we closed to Europe because Italy had become so badly infected because of their uh, China diaspora. On the 3rd of February, uh, Zhao Lijian, MFA spokesman, said, the U.S. is overreacting, closing the borders is racist, and the pandemic, the, the COVID, or at that time they were calling it the Wuhan virus, is not such a big deal, and we've contained it in China. That was the narrative. So we were uh, criticized in the New York Times and others. Well, I, I don't know which papers exactly, but mainstream media criticized us for exactly that language. Well, it was a racist decision. Uh, it's an overreaction. COVID's not that bad, et cetera. On the 4th of March, another, uh, I think it was these were tweets from Zhao Lijian said, um, the U.S. has badly botched the handling of COVID. So on the 3rd of February, we were overreacting and we, you know, we you know, followed WHO guides and we shouldn't have done all these things. A month later, we were completely the opposite of the story. I could be wrong, but I don't remember seeing the words botched handling of COVID in the, new, in the U.S. mainstream media until after I saw that tweet from Zhao Lijian. It's so easy to plant uh, language and ideas into people's heads in the U.S., they're not sure why they're repeating it, but it's it, again, it's a narrative that they've heard and they repeat it back in the in the media. This is where social media is dangerous because it picks these things up and perpetuates them without any rationality or, or critical thought going into them. I mean, I think I wonder what your perspective inside the State Department was about also the everything going on with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, because you know you couldn't even say anything about that and whether it could possibly have been a lab leak until almost a year later. Yeah, that was another case. Like He called it a racist conspiracy theory, and that got picked up. So early on, um, we recommended that we use the language Wuhan virus. And it was a really easy answer, because that's what the Chinese called it and still call it, Wuhan Bing, right? Mm -hmm. um, if that's how they refer to it, and because it originated in Wuhan, and everybody knows that, there should have been no argument, um, but you know the PRC media and other influence operations in the U.S. are at least partly to blame for the narrative that somehow calling it the Wuhan virus is racist. Wuhan is not a race. China is not a race. Han is a race. There's nothing racist about attributing the origins of viruses to the, the location. Ebola, Zika, I mean, how many, uh, with Spanish flu, how many, um, other diseases like this, especially pandemics. Hong Kong flu. I mean, I lived through that. Uh, my mom got very sick from the Hong Kong flu in the 60s. Um, nobody was complaining about it at the time because we knew that's where it came from. If you've never, if, you know, recommendation for your uh, listeners, Guns, Germs, and Steel, a really good book about uh, guns, germs, and steel, but the germs part, about the origins of disease. Tight groups of people living in close proximity and tight groups of animals, as in raising animals, in close proximity is how you get this jumping of viruses between you know, humans and animals. Uh, and, and remember, China uh, was, you know, technologically far advanced uh, throughout history in things like agriculture and the rest. Uh, and this is why you see these diseases typically uh, originating in places like China. And, and I think in the book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, he asserts that the majority of disease jumping from people to humans and back or to animals and back. Uh, come from, you know, the place where this high-tech uh, way of feeding yourself originated. So but your, your original question, I think, was uh, how that narrative got picked up. It, we, again, you have inserts in most major newspapers. You have full access to American media uh, and really no way for us to counter that in China. Um, that, that is a, um, it's a threat vector that we should address. I'm kind of reminded of how every time anybody talks about Taiwan, in, you know, mm. Western media, the words angering China appear in the headline. You know, anything anybody does that's positive towards Taiwan is going to anger China. And that is the framework. That's just the default framework. Uh, and how did we get there? You know? Well, one thing we, again, we tried to do was rewind our relationship with Taiwan back to 1979 and review the original documents and the original agreements with the PRC. Uh, and, and, you know, look at Taiwan's original international presence, both in the, in the UN 
kind of, but mostly in terms of its its partners, right? It's down to 15 right now, and that's that's by design. It's deliberate. The PRC is trying to uh, basically cut off all recognition of Taiwan and making it more difficult for them to operate in the world. Look, Taiwan was uh, the first to recognize this problem. I think it was early December. They went to Wuhan when they first got inklings that there was a problem. They went to Wuhan and said, yep, there's a problem. And they hauled back Taiwan, shut the gates, uh, and you know did pretty well in surviving. Uh, and this is why we sent uh, Health and Human Services Secretary to Taiwan in August of 2020 to get a better idea of how they did it and things we could be doing better here in the U.S. Making Taiwan radioactive, um, you know, don't touch that has been a... Uh, you know, their strategy and, and was being quite effective. Um, but if you go back and look at the Taiwan Relations Act, it didn't say anything about cutting off our relationship with Taiwan. In fact, it says that we will provide, um, you know, uh, material of a defensive nature to ensure that the, the question of Taiwan is resolved through dialogue, not coercion or use of force. We're seeing lots of coercion here with the threat of use of force. And we want to get that back to resolving the question of Taiwan because it's still an open question through dialogue. That's that's the agreement. That's the agreement that the PRC made as well in the three communiques. So th- this is why we, you know, we're talking to Taiwan, working with Taiwan, using Taiwan's advanced technology in terms of semiconductors and bringing those to the U.S. and TSMC. Uh, those are all things that are completely allowed inside the agreement with the PRC and inside our own laws, the Taiwan Relations Act. And we just, uh, Keith Kroc at the time, uh, decided to take advantage of that and, and uh, use that because that brings jobs to the U.S. It brings high tech to the U.S. This helps us. So when when the U.S. switched diplomatic relations from the Taiwan, the, the ROC, to the PRC in 79, my understanding is that at that time, the, the Chiang Kai-shek government uh, of, of Taiwan still believed that they were the legitimate China and may one day retake the mainland. But clearly, that is not the case now, and that's that. Uh, you know, if you if you go to Taiwan, which which we have many times, uh, it, it does not seem like most people, especially younger people, consider themselves anything but you know a separate country. Do you think that the U.S. relationship with Taiwan has kept pace with the shifting viewpoint in Taiwan? Well, uh, unlike our counterparts in Beijing, uh, who provide endless empty promises, Hong Kong, 2015, we won't militarize South China Sea. I, I mean, there is not an agreement they've made yet. Paris, you know, how about the Montreal Convention where they said they would stop producing chlorofluorocarbons? They took money to help transition their industry away from CFCs. And they only increased CFCs while taking the money. So there's no agreement that PRC won't. Um, back out on because as they say it's just scraps of paper on the other hand again we we can't stoop to that level we have to stand up and, and comply comply we need to follow our own agreements and be seen as trustworthy in that regard if we if we fail that then you know, we're just as bad as, as as the communist government so i think we are completely aligned with our agreement we're operating inside the boundaries of uh, our agreements with the prc and uh and we have to trust that that is going to, uh, you know, preserve the status quo. But you know, trust but verify. The fact that the Japanese have now come on very strong vocally, saying that we too uh, will come to Taiwan's aid should the PRC do something unfortunate in terms of, you know, uh, attack or whatever. Always prepared in case the PRC you know violates its agreement. That's a deterrent. And uh, again, I was so happy to hear the Japanese side uh, come on board. Uh, in the in, in alongside the U.S. and there are others who are doing the same. I mean, you're actually seeing the uh, the EU and NATO also recognizing that we need to, you know, all stand up uh, together on this, or it could get much worse in, in an effort to deter. So, uh, to your point, you know, Taiwan's expectations uh, of what the future looks like uh, have moderated. Uh, you know, the thought of taking over the uh, the uh, mainland, obviously, we're overblown at the time and, and don't make any sense now. They just want to be able to continue to do what they're doing, exist as they are as a democracy and a free market economy and all the rest. And you know, the US is committed to do to support that. Do you think, you know, you mentioned Taiwan has only 15 uh allies in the sense of or countries that recognize Taiwan. And some of these are, you know, like authoritarian 
dictatorships like Nicaragua and uh, Eswatini in, in Africa, like, do you think it would make a difference for Taiwan if, uh, you know, liberal democracies uh, either added Taiwan as an official, uh, or recognized Taiwan officially or switched allegiances to Taiwan? Well, I mean, th these are all like one and zero black and white uh, answers. And as I learned in diplomacy, one ambi ambiguity is good. Uh, it gives you room to maneuver. And, and there are very few things that are actually, you know, um, light switches on or off. So I'll point to Lithuania and the, and the Czech Republic. Lithuania has done some great work uh, in um, Right, standing up what they call a Taiwan relations office, whatever they're, you know, they're using the word Taiwan, not Taipei. It, they're doing all sorts of, they banned Huawei. They've uh, gotten out of the 17 plus one. And then the PRC has responded, but we've, like Australia discovered, the bite is, the bark is much worse than the bite. And so, and as long as we all support each other. So when Lithuania does this, or when Australia does this, the rest of the free world comes in and says, we're not going to allow you to suffer unnecessarily in this. And there's a group called the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC. If you get a chance to look at that, they're doing some really good work in this regard. And basically, so they're the ones that started the Buy Australian Table Wine uh, campaign last uh, Christmas when the PRC slapped 212% tariffs on Australian wine, basically driving it out of the Chinese market. What better time of year than to buy Christmas cheer and share with your friends? So I bought lots and lots of Australian wine and gave it to my friends. There are elegant solutions to this short of um, just rapid flipping of all countries' recognition back to Taiwan. It, 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 that's a solution. I don't think it's going to be the one that's going to work best. Uh, we have to make sure that the PRC's interests are uh, covered as well, um, at least to the point that we don't force them into a corner to do something unfortunate. Um, but look... The one thing we have that, unfortunately, the other side doesn't is we got free, free uh, share of expression of ideas and, and some really elegant solutions are possible in, in this regard. And we've seen them already, IPAC being one. The trouble with authoritarianism is you can't really allow too much innovation and creative thinking because always the question becomes, why is the Communist Party the only party that can run China? I mean, that's just an obvious question. And you start getting in trouble. And this is why innovation, creativity are hard to do in the PRC, because you quickly get into trouble. I want to go back to the Taiwan thing for a minute, because you mentioned, you know, ambiguity being useful for diplomacy, giving you room to maneuver. And there's been this debate recently over the U.S.'s strategic ambiguity about the Taiwan, like whether we would come to Taiwan's defense. Do you think that is helpful? One, the, the idea of strategic ambiguity was never a formal policy. It was, it was what somebody described the U.S. approach as. Um, I mean, maybe you could just call it indecision. Yeah, but this is putting a happy face on it. Uh, but that's what it became. That's what the policy became over time. And, and I think it's a fair description. Um, I'm not a fan of red lines. Look, when I was a young lieutenant or, or a commander, uh, I liked bright red lines because you could tell me what I could do and what I couldn't do. Um, but at this level, you, you, you don't want to force yourself. I, I, it takes me back to the Syrian red line. If you use chemical weapons on your own people, the U.S. is be forced to interact or to intervene. And then we didn't do it. And there's nothing more important, I think, in the international uh, sphere than credibility, where people know you're going to do what you say you're going to do. So I, I, I'm, I'm a Korea guy. I started off in the Korea, in the, in the Atchison line, and the lead into the Korean War, to me, are instructive here. In that when you draw a red line, and it doesn't include Korea, but includes Japan and all these others, that incentivizes others to you know, take unfortunate action, which we saw on June 25th, 1950. You realize in China, the war began in October, right? The Korean War started in October, which is bizarre. Anyway, uh, and so... You know, we were thinking through what that would look like. So if you're going to draw a red line, it's going to have geographic aspects to it. Where what would you include and what would you not include? And then whatever you draw that line, we know how the PRC works. They're really good at testing. This is a, I wish we could pick up more of this, this ability, but you draw a line here and they're going to stick a toe over it. And they're going to stick two toes over it. And they're just going to see, is that too much? Is that too much? Is that too much? Until they've obviated the whole thing. Think about the uh, Soviet Vietnam alliance in 1979, where the Soviets said that they would come to Vietnam's aid in case they were uh, attacked. What did the Chinese do? 
Well, the PLA invaded North, Northern Vietnam with 60,000 people. Uh, and, and, you know, they lost badly, but they won in that they obviated and they, you know, put paid to this commitment by the Soviets to support Vietnam. In 1980, you had the uh, Pete Peterson, a former POW, back in Vietnam beginning to establish diplomatic relations. So, uh, you know, these are all things that, uh, other than the diplomatic relations with Vietnam, this is where red lines in actually encourage adventure and they encourage testing. And if you're not up for the test, then you're, you, you lose. Whereas being ambiguous, the president's statement on Taiwan, which I think was that was well played, um, just makes them wonder how, how dedicated, how serious are they? And that doubt equals deterrence. If you're not sure of the outcome, you're going to be hesitant to, to move out. There's well, also that, really good tips if you have like a super annoying five-year-old who's like putting his toe over the line a little bit more, a little bit more, right? That ambiguity can actually make a, a big difference. I hesitate to use that analogy, but I, I, I feel the exact same way. And you maybe have a five-year-old. I had teenagers and it's even more yeah, at that level. So they're smarter. <laughs> <laughs> teenagers are all about psychological warfare. But it's interesting what you're saying about red lines because – it makes me think China drew a red line about having the, the U.S. stationing troops in Taiwan. Well, what did the U.S. do? Well, there there are troops in Taiwan. They're training. They're not stationed there. They're just, you know, there. And it's, it's actually sort of seems like the U.S. in a way kind of testing China's red line. I, you know, we've played this well for the longest time. You know, we had what we call salami slice tactics in the South China Sea and other places. And our response, you know, in the past was fairly anemic. Um, well, now we are playing the game in reverse. We're, and, and I don't think it's necessarily intentional. I just think it's the U.S. standing up and going, wait a sec, why are we doing this? This is not what we agreed to, and this isn't in our interest. And, and it's completely legitimate that we, uh, um, you know, work with uh, Taiwan to ensure that the materials of a defensive nature, that they can use them effectively. So... F-16 unit training in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. You know, that's, nobody complains about that. It's very necessary uh, because, again, we, we have the weather and the capability to, to teach. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the um, deployments uh, to, to Taiwan to train uh, at the lower level. But I'll point out, though, that Singapore does it and lots of other countries do it as well. Remember, Singapore was shipping some of its uh, Jeeps and stuff back. They went through Hong Kong and the, and the Chinese seized them. Uh, and then made a big public uh, kerfuffle, which brings to light uh, yet another consideration in diplomacy is you have to make a very clear decision about whether you make this public or whether you're going to keep it private. If you keep it private, you're going to get a different reaction than if you make it public. If you rub their part, the party's face in it and you challenge their legitimacy, you're going to get a different reaction. It's not to say you don't do it. Just think about it before you, you do. And then since we were talking about uh, red lines and and, you know, commitments in the South China Sea, you know, we changed in July of last year, we changed American South China Sea policy. Uh, It was a year long process to do this. And we said that the U.S. no longer does not recognize, we're no longer um, ambiguous. We no longer recognize the nine dash line claim. Instead, we like the 2016 United Nations uh, Convention of Law of the Sea uh, Award said, that China's excessive maritime maritime claims are not supported in international law and therefore are invalid. So the U.S. policy today is that we don't recognize the nine dash lines. Nine dash line. Uh, what I learned is policy is really ineffective if people aren't talking about it. If you put it out there but you don't follow up on it, then it, it you know it doesn't really exist. So anywhere I can, I encourage people to re- re- remind ourselves that that is the U.S. policy. And, Philippines, Indonesia, Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam, others should uh, be grateful for that. I'm not grateful. They should take advantage of that. Well, I know for, for the longest time, Chinese officials were like, you know, you, you human rights as an example. You can talk to us about human rights, but behind closed doors. We don't have to make it public. So it seems like that's where you can really nail them. Well, that works until you're not getting any headway or traction. And we're, you know, as we saw in Xinjiang and Tibet and other places, you know, those violations are getting just too much to bear. And so, uh, and here's the other thing. We talk about dialogue. If they don't come to the table to talk, what are you left with? And if you're going to make sure that your message is heard, but they're not, you know, and you have no way of communicating it privately, then you're only left with one option. It's what the PRC calls megaphone diplomacy, is where you actually have those uh, 
those conversations in the public space. A couple examples. In September of 2019, on the side of uh, United Nations General Assembly, we hosted, I think, 30 countries. It was something like that. And then four Uyghur survivors of the camps and the abuse in Xinjiang. I think you guys have been there. I've been there, seen it. Um, and this was a very public statement of support from democratic and, and you know, the free world saying, we're aware of what you're doing and we're going to publicize it. And we, sh- you know, you should probably stop doing it. Uh, uh, did it have an effect? I think you saw something about the vocation, the vocational training camps, so-called, uh, were maybe drawn down a bit, but then they took those, the uh, Uyghur, you know, uh, trainees, if you want to use that word, and they shipped them out across uh, industry in China, and they were then used as slave labor to make Nike shoes and a bunch of other things. So uh, they just went from one form of bad to another form of bad. So uh, you got to make it public, and uh, you can get a response. And, and then you can get, if you get a response, uh, that at least is a progress. The actual pro- response in the human rights area would be to sit down and have a conversation. But short of that, you know, having this conversation in the public space is helpful too. You know, is that why the, you know, State Department and other, under the Trump administration, you guys really talked a lot more about China human rights violations than publicly than a lot of other previous administrations talking, you know, calling it a genocide in Xinjiang or actually the Commerce Department actually sanctioning Chinese officials for human rights violations. Is that part of what you're talking about? I don't want to make this political, um, but I just meant to say that the treatment of the, uh, you know, Trump foreign policy, which I could speak to in the media, uh, uh, was not completely fair. Uh, the, the, I mean, you, you know, the, the, the reputation that the president himself had, but I think we stood up more for human rights than I remember in the Obama administration when I was there or in the Bush administration. We were actually very vocal about these things. It's because that's who we are. Uh, I would prefer to have conversations about human rights and other things in private, right? It's a simple leadership uh, adage is you criticize in private and you praise in public. And this is how you encourage better behavior. But when that conversation in private doesn't work any longer, then you have to make it public. So does that mean we weren't having public or private conversations with PRC on human rights? No, that was part of our talking points all along. But again, there comes a point where you're not getting action and this thing is becoming intolerable. I mean, genocide. I mean, who wants to be Neville Chamberlain again and say, you know, it's okay, we have peace. We don't want that. So it, it just seemed like it, it was, I mean, especially given the the uh, acceleration uh, of the treatment of the Uyghurs, that it, it, it was necessary to come out and say something. To be true to ourselves, we had to say something. Well, I think this kind of ties into um, how modern warfare is conducted. Uh, China seems to be a master at this kind of modern warfare, which is not boots on the ground, you know, firing machine guns. It's, you know, psychological warfare, legal warfare, propaganda warfare. And I think the U.S. is behind on that understanding in a lot of ways. Like, we still think of it as like, you know, World War II machine guns. Um, But it is interesting. I guess my question is how to, how can the U.S. and the American people combat this new form of warfare like some things you've already brought up like the you know buy australian wine reciprocity with uh chinese newspapers the houston consulate thing was a very interesting thing what tactics can we use you have to start off with the military which i'm a representative of and anytime we said talked about taiwan or war i thought about fighters and bombs and bullets and things that blow up as i said you know, that's the military side, and then you got whiskey and words on, on the diplomatic side. But the warfare in the in the PRC sense, in the uh, Sunzu Sunzu sense, uh, and this book actually captures it quite well. Um, warfare is broad spectrum. It you know, at Clausewitz, you know, German philosopher said that war is an extension of politics, which gives this impression that. It, it's diplomats, 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 boom, we're going to war. No more diplomacy, it's combat, right? That's an unfortunate characterization because when we think about war, we just think about active shooting. The PRC looks at it much differently. They look at war as a spectrum. Uh, it's economic warfare. We know that's been going on as we, you know, IPR theft and all those other things. There's 
is political warfare, is, you know, uh, sowing doubt and, and friction between two political parties and, and, and two worldviews. Um, there's information warfare. As I mentioned, Xinhua, you know, Chinese media inside the U.S. actively putting out narratives that support the Chinese position, undermining narratives that support uh, our own. And it's crossed to what, you know, the military calls it dime field, diplomatic, information, military, economic, and then the F is uh, finance, uh, information, not intelligence, and then L is lawfare. Uh, what we did in 2016 uh, is lawfare. We used the law uh, to advance American interests. So what I would say about educating the American people on war is the PRC has been actively at war with us since 1950. Uh, look at their internal language description of the U.S., and they refer to us as the enemy. They have always referred to us as the enemy. So we're trying to cooperate. They're treating us as the enemy. The, it's a lopsided relationship, and it's defined by the most negative. And the most negative in this case is the adversarial, the enemy. So we need to meet them um, there. How do we make this real to Americans? Examples. This is where Ennis Cantor uh, gets to the, uh, you know, my kids level. It gets to the level of the average American citizen. Say, why is he making so much fuss about the Uyghurs? And then they start listening more and more to conversations about them. Maybe they do research for themselves. Um, other things you could talk about is uh, school boards. Uh, the PRC uh, attempts to skew uh, what your students learn or what you're allowed to say through Confucius Institutes and through active involvement uh, in f and through finance and bribes and travel to school boards. There's a congressman, uh, I'll let him tell the story, who says, you know, his wife is on a school board in a town of 100,000 people. And the PRC consulate came to her and offered a full expense paid trip to the PRC. I mean, that's that's warfare. That's information warfare. Uh, and we have to get more savvy to that. Uh, it's different than it was. I hadn't heard that about school boards being, you know, invited on these junkets to China. I mean, like, well, the, the school board, I mean, is that is that just to get school boards to be willing to accept a Confucius Institute? Or do they have other, like, agenda items for, you know, what goes in American curriculum when with respect to China policy? Or, I mean, what could that even be for? Back to the statement that the Chinese have been at war all along. They see uh, you, our democratic, and we, we're the leader of this, not just us, it's all democratic and free market systems, are a direct threat to the rehash of communism. Communism died in 1991, and they're trying to resuscitate it and say that authoritarian government under Marxist-Leninist rules is the future and that everybody should allow it to happen and, in fact, we encourage it. So if you're thinking about this as a long-term uh, strategic, you know, um, uh, prolonged battle, uh, this works perfect sense. This is an investment. This is cheap. You know, this is 5,000 bucks uh, that you invest in these individual people. And, and I was always amazed at how much value the PRC side puts into banquets. You know, when food scarcity is a constant in your history, a sumptuous banquet is a very uh, impressive thing, complete with ornate table decorations and the PLA singers and dancers and all that stuff that we enjoyed uh, while I was there. But these are all part of Warfare. We think of it in this very narrow strip of things that explode. They think of it broadly in terms of societal and cultural uh, conflict. So taking people to the PRC to uh, show them and win them over and make them, you know, amenable to your position, or just so you say nice things in classrooms and in meetings, that's a great investment. Compared to the cost of a single missile or an aircraft carrier, it's infinitesimally small and it works. What kind of gets me about the way that the Chinese Communist Party does it is that you would expect them to do it for leaders on a national or international scale. Or, for example, we're in New York City. Uh, the new mayor-elect, Eric Adams, he's been Brooklyn Borough President for a number of years. And as Brooklyn Borough President, he traveled to China seven times on these junkets. And one of the things that you know he tried to do is get this Chinese friendship arch built in Brooklyn, uh, and it never went through. But you can see, you know, you can see the objective, right, for the Chinese Communist Party, that this guy could be, rise higher in politics in the U.S. In fact, now he's the mayor, going to be the mayor of New York City. And mayors and, of New York have run for president. Right. So it makes sense to cultivate somebody like Eric Adams, but a random school board member in small town America it's still 
important enough for them to do that. They call this, in the spy world, they call this assessing. Just looking around at people who have the potential for pick, pick an activity. And they've got free run of the country, and so they're out as they should be. Back to reciprocity, American diplomats are severely uh, restricted to who you can meet with and where you can travel uh, in the China. And if you just, you know, Americans are all about fairness. It's amazing how we really put great stock in fairness. And then if you can make this more public to the American people, that our diplomats in, in the PRC have, are basically locked down while theirs run amok in our country, I think Americans would stand up more and go, yeah, that's not fair. And you can't make them allow us to be more free inside China. They won't do that. So you're going to have to take the other way and treat them with reciprocity. But they do that. This is how they get at those people. The mayor, this is how they get the school boards. It's because they have the free run of the U.S. Uh, and we have to stay true to who we are, and we really can't squash that. Uh, but we can. there are other ways you can get about that, addressing that problem. I'm just upset that the Chinese Communist Party has never invited us to get an all-expenses-paid trip to China. I don't think you want to go. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, it's actually a one-way trip. Instead, instead of the Michaels, we'd, we'd have the Chris and Shelleys and Matts, you know? It, it, you don't want that. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> I mean, when you talk about needing to you know, educate Americans about this, right, about this type of warfare, isn't it kind of hard? Because even just using that term warfare or war is – it's seen as pretty – uh, inflammatory. Like we, we don't really like to talk about it. We, the most we can say is that we're competing with China, right? Right. It, you know, the last administration, the national security policy. You guys came out and said, you know, this is actually a great power competition. And even that was seen as like, whoa, do we want to go there? Do we want to actually call this a great power competition? And you know, can't we just call it like a friendly economic competition or something like that? So how do we talk about this? when even saying these words is considered too much. This is why China uh, uncensored and China unscripted and all the things you do are so important is until this gets into the public space and they realize just how bad it is, uh, you won't get Americans to, to buy into this or, or sort of support it. Um, but, you know, my experience has been, uh, I, I speak uh, in public events uh, quite frequently and, and they're actually not so afraid of, of, the thought that there is, we're back to a Cold War setting, uh, which we are. I mean, that, that did an op-ed back in the spring on the, the new Cold War. It's similar to the last one. It's existential and it's ideological. Then you got the whole fact that they're in our country and, and we've got, and they've got entire swaths of Wall Street and others, uh, you know, touting their line. It's going to be more complicated than the last one, but obviously we, we, we can think our way through this one. Um, I, yes, you got to get the American people on board, but good Lord, you got to get the finance and the economic folks on board too. Um, a really good article from May of last year uh, about Saline Motors, S-A-L-E-E-N Motors. I've never heard any other company describe what it feels like to get your pockets picked in the PRC, but these guys were going to build some high-end you know, cars and they shared all their IPR in a joint venture, which are the rules when you go to China to get access to the Chinese market. And then they were sent away with nothing. They lost everything. In fact, they lost the trademark to Celine Motors. So now the PRC can market Celine, and Steve Celine from Los Angeles is no longer able to do that. That, that, was, that story came out in Los Angeles Times in May of 2020. I recommend everybody have a look at that uh, to just understand how it works. Why have other countries, uh, companies not you know, said that? You look at what happened, is happening to Tesla right now, and they're getting the same treatment. Uh, you got to ask why other companies aren't more vocal about that. And I think there's always this hope this hope that they might be able to get back into the market. I mean, this this started with Lord McCartney in 1790. The, the line was, if we could sell one person from China, you know, uh, 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 one shirt, the looms of Manchester would stay busy for, you know, for 100 years or something like that. It's this myth of the China market that continues to play um, out. And, and it really is a myth, but more people need to be vocal about it. So we got to get at Wall Street, we got to get at the CEO, the boardrooms, and we need to let the, China, the American people as you're doing, understand that it's not all happy, fuzzy pandas and Mulan. I mean, we've tried to warn Elon Musk, but he won't listen to us. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You said Americans need to know how bad it is. So here, here is a soapbox. How would you tell uh, your average American how bad it is in a way that they could understand? I think the Michael story, uh, and here's a question. Why is the story of the two Michaels, Spavor and Covert, who were held for you know two years 
no charges uh, in solitary in some horrible uh, conditions. Why has that story not come out? Meng Wanzhou, as soon as she landed, the, the, the Huawei heiress, she lands in China and she tells her whole epic tale of how she survived and stared down the man. Why have we not heard from the, Spav- the Michaels? Or was there an agreement made that they would not tell just how horrible the conditions were in China? What well, kind of, that's barbaric, right? We call that a hostage diplomacy. Uh, these are stories that touch, you know, on the common person. Um, media is, is the surest way to do it. There's a good documentary out there called uh, In the Name of Confucius that people should watch. It talks about how Confucius Institutes really work, and what their agenda really is. Uh, it's going to happen through this medium, right? Whether it's Instagram for my kids or Reddit or, you know, stuff that I'm not familiar with, not Twitter. Um, but we got to get the word out. Um, and it's got to be people other than me telling the story. It's got to be my, my daughter's friends who go or, or the like. It's got to come from people they know and trust. We got to start that TikTok channel. Huh. That's where the kids yeah. are. Yeah, you'll get punted <laughs> pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned earlier... Um, the, the best lever the PRC has, it's genius, is not actual money going into pockets. It's the promise of money going into pockets. They, there's always, they always hold it out there as if, you know, it, for schools, right? Uh, we'll, you, we might fund that center or give you those grants or whatever you want. I mean, they don't ever have to actually commit funds to uh, these things. It's the promise of largesse uh, from, from the China market and all that stuff. I mean, And that payday never comes. That never comes. That's exactly right. Um, uh, or if it does, it comes with so many strings that you wish you hadn't made the deal. Our debt service suspension initiative, D, uh, DSI, came out of the Paris Club. It was basically looking at the, the damage that COVID has done to the global economy and the 77 poorest countries uh, who are going to suffer the most won't be able to make their debt payments uh, to the PRC on their Belt Road project stuff. And, and that process should continue. It sort of got held up. Uh, but these are elegant ways of getting at um, this nefarious activity uh, and to expose it for what it is. Because there's a lot of African countries right now going, this is not the deal we made, right? But the, the loan has non-disclosure language in it. So if they do disclose, then there's you know monetary and legal penalties. And all we got to do is expose it. When people see it, they'll get it. And then everyone will see, oh, they've been doing this to all of us. Exactly. Yeah. That is very much when you were talking about holding out the promise of money, totally, entirely what the Belt and Road is built on. Yep. And as we know, the poster child for this is the China Pakistan Economic Corridor. I mean, just that one's easy. Just Google it and you'll see, you know, 15 Chinese engineers blown up on a bus here, three engineers dead here. Uh, the Pakistanis don't like it. It, it you know, it um, violates their sovereignty. And then we've seen that PRC don't make great neighbors or, or, or guests in Africa. They, uh, well, think about Libya. When they evacuated Libya, uh, the non-combatant evac- evacuation operation, 35,000 Chinese workers were in Libya. Nobody had any idea it was to that size or scale. If you were to count uh, the Chinese workers in Africa or, or on, on the Belt Road projects, I think you'd be shocked that, you know, this is how you uh, create jobs because there aren't jobs in China. It's how you look population pressure relief is through these programs. And again, Chinese companies won't hire local. They only hire uh, their own people. Well, so one thing we've talked a lot about on the show is the idea of decoupling with China. But I I know you say we shouldn't call it decoupling. Why is that? So decoupling uh, is a Chinese term that they floated. And it implies that, like, uh, you know, two gears in your transmission that the relationship is nice and discreet, right? And so we can pull that back, uh, but leave this intact. The fact is our systems are two trees that have grown too close together and the root balls have become completely entangled by design. Uh, and so if you cut this one, you actually have damage elsewhere. You, there's no discreet way to uh, eliminate one activity without hurting the rest. And so I'm thinking of all the supply chain issues. Right. right. And you're seeing it in, in spades right now. So disentangling is a better word. And I used two trees as an example. And the other day, it kind of the better analogy would be a forest with kudzu in it. And, 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 you know, those vines have totally entangled into our economy and are choking it out in a sort of a parasitic sense. So, um, but nonetheless, we still got to rip and disentangle all those vines out of our system so we know exactly what is our own and what is theirs. And then when we do 
engage again, we can engage in discrete ways that allow us to, if the deal isn't going quite well, we can, we can always disengage. Can't do that right now. Well, but I mean, disentangling requires the, the cutting of vines on both sides. It can be painful. Right? Which is, yeah. It can be very painful. Well, yeah. That is one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about this whole cutting trees or whatever vines is that people don't really want to hear that it's going to be painful, right? That's another thing that's difficult in terms of messaging or talking to the American people about- The trade war hurt American farmers yes, so much. Yes, exactly. Like every time any action is taken against China, then it's like, well, this is hurting American companies. This is hurting American farmers, like you said. How do we uh, talk about that? So it's going to be painful. I, you know, I thought the, the pandemic was going to be the opportunity where, you know, because our economy, they, all economies suffered uh, well. And then we have the supply chain issues uh, where it gave us a really good opportunity to find other markets and other, um, you know, sources of bicycles and, and whatnot. There's still an opportunity here. You know, the, the supply chain thing hasn't quite resolved yet. And American business, if incentivized, will do things. An example, I, I was in, when I lived there, when I was at State, I was in Arlington, I was looking for a bicycle. And for a while there, you remember uh, during the pandemic, like all bicycles were, they were empty, the bike stores were empty. Well, I, they started refilling. So I looked at the origins of these bikes and uh, you were thinking it was gonna be that one factory in Guangzhou that makes every bicycle, right? Any bicycle less than $2,000 was built in the same factory in China. That was by design, that's a vertical monopoly. One bicycle came from Vietnam, and surprisingly, the other one came from Cambodia. It's happening, and you're hearing today more and more American businesses. Was it uh, was it Google? What? Someone's leaving China right now. And just says, oh Yahoo. Yahoo, Yahoo! It's just too difficult to do business. This we waited too long. It's it's it, but it was inevitable. It's got to happen. And and who's the beneficiary of this? India, Southeast Asia. There's lots and lots of places where you have uh, fairly low labor input costs. Uh, and and you know decent product productivity that American businesses should find other markets. That it's it's the right thing to do at this point. So I like what you were saying about calling it um, disentangling the, the the idea that there is a parasitic nature to this because, like as you mentioned, disentangling was by design. And what we're seeing is the Chinese Communist Party heading to a place where it no longer needs the United States. It still does right now, absolutely. But what happens if it gets to the point where the Chinese Communist Party has sucked all the life it needs out of the United States and can go on its own? You mean like they've stolen our IP, their currency, their RMB is now like a global reserve currency? That yeah, sort of thing. Their, their digital UN is what everyone's using instead of the US dollar. Well, I'm happy to say we don't have to have you speculate on that because people are awake now and and – Seeing is believing, but in the, in the modern world, believing is seeing, and it's taken all this time to get people to believe that there was a problem, that they're now actually recognizing it, and that's a good thing. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, there were a lot of things that w went into that. Most of it was the pandemic that got people to actually recognize that they weren't playing above, you know, cards on the table. They were covering up, and it seems like trying to make the rest of the world sick by allowing international flights long after they close their own borders internally, domestically. So it's a narrative. It's a messaging opportunity to tell people that um, if things aren't all well, fine. Look, there's a lot of belt tightening uh, available in the U.S. We, we got a lot of room where we can take some uh, pain and we should take, and that's where we're at right now. Um, we can survive just fine for the next two, three, five years while industry relocates, while we find other markets while, you know, the world recognizes the, the real problem here and responds to it. We have really yet to do that. Uh, we, we are not fully competing. Well, I think you're right that there is cause for optimism. Like I remember when we started China Uncensored in 2012, hardly anyone was really loudly raising the alarms about the Chinese Communist Party. And now, like, you know, there's like free China memes Instagram page, like people are John talking. John Oliver about, did an episode about Taiwan, you know. Yeah, people are talking about it in a way that just did not happen even 10 years ago. When it's in the public space, when John Oliver is doing Panda Express, uh, that's winning, right? When when a government, you know, wonk says it, they, they tune you out. But when popular media, uh, and, and it gets into the popular narrative, then uh, we're in good shape. 
I like that, you know, with Ennis Cantor, he's a, you know, he's an immigrant from Turkey, right? And it's a tick. And he's the, he's the American who's raised the most awareness recently. He just came out with Hong Kong shoes now. Oh, Ooh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Did he? I haven't seen that. Yeah, uh, that was yesterday. <laughs> you know, you don't really understand your country until you've not, until you've lived outside of it. And this is another thing. We're very critical of ourselves and that's good, right? We're not, you know, sitting back in our laurels. Uh, we fix things, you know, and in general, things in the U.S. continue to get better over time. We're not utopia. We never will be utopia. There will always be problems. But the fact that that, that, that slope of that curve or that line is positive is, the, I mean, that's what you should hope for. And nobody understands that better than immigrants. Lieutenant Governor Sears in Virginia gets it. She knows what the, the hope uh, and the promise of the U.S. I would love to see Americans travel, more travel overseas and see how it is elsewhere and come back with a better perspective of what's right and wrong. Look, there's a lot wrong in this country yet, but I think we're still in a good place to address it and, and, and continue to improve and be the beacon on the hill that is, you know, that we've always been historically. As long as they don't travel to China, because the State Department back then said, uh, don't don't travel China, COVID and arbitrary arrest. Yeah. Be very yeah. careful. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've talked a lot about making China real to Americans, how to talk about this in a way that gets into the public consciousness. So when it's in the public consciousness, what can Americans do uh, to confront the challenge that's coming from the Chinese Communist Party? Well, Shelley, I'm glad you raised the Olympics. <laughs> 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 that's how you do an interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that to me is one avenue uh, where, uh, you know, Americans vote with their feet in their pocketbooks. And, you know, the sponsors of the Olympics from the U.S. side tend to have, um, they stand to lose if um, Americans vote with their feet on this. Um, so th th it's one example of many where uh, our own media, uh, our own uh, businesses and others can do things to shift away from Xinjiang sourced tomatoes or Xinjiang sourced cotton or China sourced labor. Uh, and those things. And um, I'm not a big fan of active boycotts or, you know, online campaigns. Uh, but I just think common sense says people should just be more aware of what's going on. Just that, just being aware uh, will shape buying decisions, travel decisions, all these other things. It's just simple awareness. It seems like a simple problem, but as you can tell, and, and I've been frustrated with this, it's, it's really hard to get these things out into the public space. But we're there. It's been 10 years of trying and, and it is finally starting to pick up. People believe it and they are now seeing it. And I think uh, that bodes well for the future in this regard. And look, I, I'm not saying we take them down, the uh, Communist Party. We just have to moderate their behavior. We have to start acting as a normal country uh, and not somehow special or, or, or you know, deserve to be treated differently. So. I do wonder if that is possible with the Chinese Communist Party since... The, the, communism is so focused on struggle. As you said, they've been calling us the enemy since 1950. Like, if that is your worldview, well, you know, the Biden administration has been calling it durable coexistence. I wonder if that is possible with a regime like the Chinese Communist Party. Well, they, they did a pretty good job between 76 and 79, or call it 1980. Uh, there have been rectification movements to kind of snap this thing out. Of course, that requires... Um, changes, which would be painful, but, um, you know, we were supposed to see a change here and, and, you know, coming up in 2022, that never happened with the, uh, second term of the, the, the core of the party, the people's leader. Um, you're, you're hearing noises from inside China of people who are unhappy with the way things are going. The fact that the relationship with the U S has been so badly handled as to wake the Americans up to what's happening. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's impossible. And I think there are enough moderate voices and, and rational human beings. I mean, Liu He, uh, I think uh, the, the negotiator on the trade uh, deal, I think he gets it. You know, I think there are people inside the system that get it. And uh, you saw the Red Roulette. You interviewed Desmond Shum on the show. And, and uh, you know, there are people inside China who see the problem. And uh, some here in the U.S. willing to stand up and say something. So we're back to just making people aware of the problem. Uh, does that resonate inside the PRC? Well, the fact that they held his wife at gunpoint uh, to 
to convince him not to publish the book tells you they're afraid of that book. So maybe these are all pressures that uh, will force them to, to, to adjust course. Well, so as we wrap up the podcast, um, it is important for viewers to educate themselves. What uh, what sources would you recommend for people to look into? I know you mentioned Gary Gershanik's book, uh, Political Warfare. Definitely, that's a great one. What else would you recommend? Man? And the book that really made it clear to me was Silent Invasion, uh, Clive mm. Hamilton out of Australia, 2015. You know, the story of uh, the last Olympic torch marathon, 2008, through Australia, and the Chinese uh, consulate had rousted a whole bunch of students to beat up the Tibetans and others who were protesting the PRC treatment of its minorities. I mean, inside your own country, they're kind of operating, doing their own police operations. So that's the opening story in that book. I would definitely read that. And a happier book, uh, obviously Red Roulette, you have to read, but Evan Osnos did a book called The Age of Ambition, which I thought was a fair treatment of the aspirations of the Chinese people, who we love, by the way. Um, you know, all of us have been focused on China all our lives and, and uh, you know, I, I hope for nothing but the best for the Chinese people. But anyway, the age of ambition kind of speaks to their aspirations and what they want and all the hard work that they've put into, you know, the miracle that is, you know, the PRC over the last 40 years. So, again, our concern is more with the government. There's three books and political warfare, one more, but uh, that should hold you for a while. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, David. I, I feel like this is one of the rare podcasts where I'm I'm, I'm walking away feeling hopeful instead of crushed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hopeful. That is great. That's a good way to, to end the podcast, I think. And you guys are doing all the right things, so keep going. Well, thank you. And the audience can do the right thing by liking and subscribing and commenting for the algorithm. If you're watching on YouTube, otherwise it doesn't make sense if you're on Spotify. Apple Podcast. Anyways, David, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank you. Well, what I got from this is that one of us needs to join the NBA. How about you, Shelly? Yeah, I think I'm the obvious choice, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would be more uh, equitable uh, height distribution in the NBA, right? You remember Muggsy Bogues? He was five foot three, and he was an excellent player. How, I don't. How long ago was this? Oh, this would have been like the 90s. Okay. Yeah, he was on the, the Warriors back when they sucked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, it's, it's good that John Oliver did his Taiwan thing. Uh-huh. I mean, he's he is kind of a knockoff Chris Chappell. That's right. We started this before I last do week have tonight. to give his team props that it was a pretty good episode. Like it it was pretty nuanced on the whole issue. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Good good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's watching John Oliver. Uh you, you know, we're not on HBO and we're not at the point where you, we publish an episode and then um, two million people have watched it the next day. But we're getting there. We're getting Something there. Something is wrong with this world. No, no, no. I think we're getting there. Yeah. Look at how far we've come. That's true. You know, seven years ago, we had gone to Hong Kong for the 2014 Umbrella Revolution. And I'm, I know that because Facebook keeps reminding me. Oh, yeah, because that was- <laughs> That this was this seven time. years ago. This you know, this, these two weeks. And you know how many people we had subscribed to us at that point? Was it like 60 or 70? It was 66,000 subscribers. Wow. So we've come a long way. That is true. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, it looks like we'll have, uh, we have some more to go, but it also looks like that the China issue is not going to go away anytime soon. That's right. But I mean, this is why we also need to diversify our content creation, just in case the China situation is ever resolved. You mean tomorrow the Chinese Communist Party collapses? Well, hopefully not tomorrow, because then we're, then we're out of a job. But if we can, ahead of time, establish some new shows that become instantly popular, uh, then we will, we, we will future-proof ourselves. I'm thinking of doing like a makeup show. Cool. Cool. Or I guess what's the next great dictator that could threaten us all there are a lot of great dictators i would say probably the number one that i'm concerned about is the next supreme leader of these united states chris chapel <laughs> that hits very close to home for you i know <laughs> <laughs> well no i think i don't think we are going to be out of a job anytime soon and that is another message of hope well 
<laughs> Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly Chong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Thank you for joining us in this fight. Wait, we're in a fight? Oh, no. You are symbolic of 40 years of U.S. Sino policy. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> China? China. You were, this is China we're talking about? No, not China. Uh, they, like we can make so much money. I had a wonderful fax with the uh, official. <laughs> is that what they're calling it now? No. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I started thinking about honey traps and banquets. You can't and... fax a honey trap. No, that's no. true. That's true. See, they really, they've missed out on that opportunity. If you restrict U.S. diplomats from traveling in China and you only give them, you know, fax machines, how are they going to be there's honey the, the, There's this whole world of sexting that they could get U.S. officials under if they would just even allow text messaging. Yeah. What could you do with beepers? <laughs> I know the only people who had beepers that I remember in the 90s were like the kids at high school who sold drugs. And there were doctors, you know, not not in my high school, but they also used beepers. All right, this is going way off track now. Yeah. Apparently this podcast is still going on. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether to stop it. And now I, I wish we had. Uh-huh. Now I've already signed off. How do we end something that's already ended but hasn't? I don't know. I guess it feels like a lot of again. relationships I've been in. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, feels like a metaphor for U.S. China relations. Am I right? Uh, uh, well, we'll be here for another 20 hours until we figure out how to end this. So I, I recommend and this is the first time I'm going to do this. I just recommend you stop watching now. Click click off. That's it can end for you. We'll still be here. It's like an episode of watching uh, Chris Chapel watching paint dry. Watching Paint Dry with Chris Chappell. Is that the name of the it's show? It's so boring. That's the name of the show. Chris can't even remember the name <laughs> of the show. That's right. Check it out on Facebook. Yeah. Bye, everyone. That's going to be the show that future proofs us. There we go. People always need to have paint. And somebody to watch it dry for them. Because what if you touch it before it's dry? That's bad. That would be bad. That's why I'm there on the scene. Watching. The paint dry. <laughs> If I any, hope people have clicked away. <laughs> if anyone's still watching, goodbye. <laughs> Do you have the power to sign us off? I thought only I did. Oh. Actually, you are controlling the recording I, button. So I, as soon as you no, just hit stop recording. No, go, go, go ahead, Chris, sign us off. Well, no, I can't because I've already done it. I know I, I don't have the power anymore. <laughs> this is this is what happens when we record for too long and then we we get lost. All right. Very true. I will sign off. Goodbye, everyone. You can't sign off. You can only stop the recording. That's the only stop power you have. Stop the recording. Have.